Well, hi, everybody. Um, as you, I see people are starting to pop on, um, I'm really, really happy to introduce two friends tonight. Um, I'm going to first say Scott is such a good friend and he's such a supporter of my store, of me, and I don't know what I'd do without him. And he's an amazing writer and he's the reason and I got to be in the New York Times, <laughs> which was awesome. And not for doing I was going to say, either. that's not always a good thing, you know. <laughs> no, I got to, You remember when you did that, that uh, story on independent book selling? Yes. And yeah, I was I also like, know that you, Kathleen you, is you an came old in and they did pictures at the store? Yeah, look, there's also an old expression uh, on the cover of Time One Week, doing time the next week. So be careful <laughs> what you wish for for national media. Be careful media what you wish closure. for, you may get it. <laughs> and Lee, I'm so excited. Um, as we were talking about, I am a total Sylvia Plath, like, nerd. I've read everything. I've read all her poems. I've driven my family crazy from an, a very young age with, with Sylvia Plath. And when I saw this book, I, it didn't click that it was you at first. And then when Scott called me up, I go, oh my God, Lee wrote that book. Yeah. So tonight I'm going to invite everybody to listen to this wonderful conversation about um, Lee's book, The Last Confessions of Sylvia P. And um, I will pop on periodically to annoy you guys. So be prepared. And uh, let's welcome him here to the DGP Zoom studio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Kathleen, you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Uh, you know, people need to know uh, who don't. A great good place for books in Oakland uh, has a kind of a, well, first of all, it's a gem of a bookstore, uh, but also it kind of has an outsized influence, I think, on book selling. Has for a long time. I think the, the books that uh, click there tend to click a lot of places and people watch very carefully what uh, Kathleen and her her colleagues picked to focus on. So we are grateful that you're giving us a spotlight a time for this book. And um, I should do the official uh, introduction for Lee Kravitz here because uh, uh, we'll do a little bio. Lee Kravitz is the author of the new novel, The Last Confessions of Sylvia P. But he's also the author of, of a couple of nonfiction books. Uh, uh, Strange Contagion is one that I particularly loved about mass hysteria. You should definitely look at that. And his first book, was called Super Survivor. She's written for a lot of different publications, including the New York Times, New York Magazine, The Atlantic, Psychology Today, The Daily Beast, San Francisco Chronicle, and for PBS. So welcome, Lee Kravitz. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Oh my God, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Scott. A great, good place for books. I love this store. I miss going into this store. There's just something really special. It has this like it's you know it's just like you said it's this gem of a store. It has this sort of like corral that you walk through in the front and it's just, it's, it's like a little cave full of books. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Kathleen, thanks for having me. And, for yeah, having and I always me. say it's curated with love. I can tell. You can you actually can really tell. Okay. You really can. That's the thing about independent stores. I was talking to somebody recently about the big box stores versus the independent stores. And it is, it's about curation. It's about, it, it feels like you're walking through somebody's, I don't know, like personal book bookshelves. Um, that's what makes, that's what gives, I think, these independent stores such character. We could also ask people what I should be reading and they always know. And I love that. Yeah. You go in looking for one book, you walk out with 10, but that's great because you get your nice stand full. Uh, so look, we're going to talk tonight about the last confessions of Sylvia P. Uh, and I think, Lee, we should probably start by taking a step back and explaining to people tuning in exactly what this is. So it's a novel about a real person. So as we know, novel is fiction, it's made up. Mm -hmm. uh, but Sylvia P is Sylvia Plath, one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, certainly one of the most influential. And so give us the premise, because you start with what I consider to be a very exciting and intriguing, inciting incident, as they like to say in the writing yes. business. Talk about what is the 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 gem that gets us started on this journey of this story. Sure, so it starts off modern times um, and we have these two brothers, these sort of blue collar brothers who flip houses um, and they've come across uh, in an attic, a lockbox, and they open up the lockbox and inside they find these three notebooks and they figure, well, 
they look old. They might be worth something. So they bring it to an auction house called St. Ambrose Auction House. And that's where we meet Esty. Um, and Esty is uh, a curator at this auction house. She's about to retire. Um, she has a career, you know, really working with, with literary artifacts. And she immediately recognizes this as having something to do with Sylvia Plath. It, it looks like somebody has transcribe the bell jar into three notebooks. And it's possible that these are the original handwritten drafts of the bell jar. And so that sort of launches us into sort of a discussion and really into the, the rest of the novel really about what, you know, what the significance of Sylvia Plath is to, to modern audiences and also to people who discovered her early, early on. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, that was the thing that really sort of sparked me in general, like, you know, is Sylvia Plath really relevant today? And if so, why? Well, but to be clear, this is not an, an academic exercise. This is not a literary journal uh, um, deconstruction of Sylvia Plath. I mean, you start, I love that you start with these two guys and being somebody from New England, I can immediately picture them in my head there. <laughs> what we would call flippers, they flip mm -hmm. property. So they bought this old house that they're going to wreck and turn into something or renovate. And they find this thing and they immediately think, hey, this could be worth some dough. Let's bring it in and see if we can get some money off of this. Look, who puts something that's not precious in a lockbox and hides it in an attic? That's exactly so, it. Yeah. so their instinct is to bring it to, to an expert, the curator, who, we, who is turns out to be one of the major characters of your book. So you've called this book, uh, because it is a novel, but it involves real historical figures as uh, reality adjacent. I kind of love that expression, reality yeah. adjacent. What do you mean by reality adjacent for those who are interested? Yeah, in so when I first started writing this book and came up with the idea for writing it, I knew that Sylvia Plath was gonna be in it. Basically we follow three different characters um, and you know, one's in 1952, one's in 1960, or one to 58, I should say, um, and then one in 2019. And these are sort of disparate stories. They're three different stories, three different novels, basically. And the only thing that they have in common is that Sylvia Plath appears in each of them. And Sylvia Plath's a real person. And so we have these semi-fictitious characters. I say semi because some are real people and some are fictitious, but we see how their lives, which are fully fiction, sort of uh, side up against, you know, side up against Sylvia Plath's reality. And so it's sort of reality adjacent in that we have this whole fictional world that sort of includes Sylvia's path. Um, so yeah, I, I just thought that that was really the way to go. Also partly because when you're writing about a character like Sylvia Plath, you gotta be really careful. Um, you wanna treat it with respect and you also, you, you don't wanna overplay your hand. Um, so I knew that every time Sylvia appeared in the novel, it was gonna be something specific and special and so I wanted to sort of flesh that out. Well, let's remind people before we get too far into this exactly who Sylvia Plath was and why she's such a significant figure. I mean, yeah. she in the United States, uh, she sold her book, uh, uh, her novel, uh, The Bell Jar, has sold millions of copies. I think more than three million copies in the United States alone. And it seems like almost everybody we know. Uh, especially young women who, who become very obsessed with Sylvia have read this book. But in fact, before the novel, she was quite an accomplished poet who basically transformed to a certain extent our concept of poetry to this day. So let's yeah. talk about Sylvia Plath, why she is such a, a seminal figure and really the centerpiece of this book. So there's, there's two answers to that. Um, I can tell you so one, why is Sylvia Plath sort of interesting to people today? Um, there's sort of a simple answer to this part, which is basically, look, she died at a very young age. And when she died, she left behind this huge amount of work that is hugely significant and beautiful. Um, she's an incredible writer. Um, but it sort of left this sort of gaping hole when she died. And so it, we've been able to fill that hole with a mythology of who she is and who she was, um, which I think sort of lends itself to sort of, um, uh, you know, it's sort of, you know, her legendary status. But let's also not forget that she's also, like I said, like an incredible writer. Um, I discovered this book and this, this sort of dovetails into, into your question. 
I discovered this book. I was actually, before I became a, a writer, I was a, a, a psychotherapist. And um, I wound up working, this is 13 years ago. I wound up working at a, at a mental hospital, which was the exact same mental hospital that author Ken Kesey uh, worked at when he was a Stegner fellow. Um, and he wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, um, which I just thought was kind of a cool fact. Um, I wind up walking in one day to the patients where the patients were, and there was a book stand and that's where the bell jar was. Um, it was it was left there in a kiosk for the patients to read along with like all these sort of, you know, cop books and detective novels, but someone had left the bell jar there. And as I'm rereading it, because I had read it many years earlier, what I saw was actually a parallel story. It wasn't just, so the bell jar is sort of, it, it's a veiled memoir of Sylvia Plath's experience as a young woman being hospitalized for bipolar disorder or manic depression. Um, she spent six months in this, in this uh, mental uh, asylum and or in this ward, and then she's released and she sort of becomes her own, her own person, her own woman. That's the story of the bell jar. But if you read it, there's actually a code that's sort of sewn into the pages of the bell jar. You just have to know to, where to look for it. It's actually the parallel story of the birth of something called confessional poetry. And so confessional poetry is this idea that, I mean, when we think about poetry today, we think of poetry that's raw and honest, and it's about our thoughts and feelings. Um, but before confessional poetry came out, that wasn't what poetry was. There were all kinds of different movements, you know, um, you know, poetry movements that usually had to do with politics or nature or uh, the state of mankind. Um, but confessional poetry was about things that we're not supposed to talk about, you know, lust, uh, anger, hatred, uh, abortion, uh, death, uh, incest. I mean, you name it, there's all kinds of things that we're not supposed to talk about, but confessional poetry did. And the thing that confessional poetry and the, 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 the writers of confessional poetry have in common is that they didn't create confessional poetry in universities or in really cool towns or cities. They were, it was created from mental wards. You have Anne Sexton, Sylvia Plath, Robert Lowell, all of these sort of creators of confessional poetry were in mental hospitals being treated for bipolar disorder around the same time. And then they all get out and they all kind of congregate in Boston, Massachusetts in the early 50s. That's the birth of confessional poetry. And her poetry, that this form of poetry is so relevant to today. We wouldn't have music that we have today if we didn't have confessional poetry. We wouldn't have memoir that we have today if we didn't have confessional poetry. Nonfiction, no way. Fiction, absolutely not. Her influence is significant. Well, look, there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, uh, we should point out that those three characters or versions of those three people appear in this book. And you, in fact, take us to that hospital in Massachusetts. I think it was in Concord. Was it McLean? It's right outside of Concord. At Concord, that's right. It's called McLean okay. Hospital. So we actually, through your imagination, through your fiction, you actually take us there and we're there with Lola and we're there with Sylvia Plath. And that gives us yet another one of your main characters for telling this story is the doctor mm -hmm. who is assigned this patient, uh, Sylvia Plath. Talk a little bit about that. And why did you decide to create this character or is that mm -hmm. not a character, is that a real person uh, yeah. as one of your storytellers? So when I, when I first start, start, uh, set out to actually write this novel, um, I knew that I wanted to show the people that influenced Sylvia Plath to become the person that she, we all know and love her today, right? And to do that, I knew that I needed to go to the beginning. And so in reality, what, what happened was Sylvia had um, you know, a manic break and she was sent to McLean Hospital. How old was she then, do you remember? Yeah, she, she was, was 19, almost 20. She was still a teenager. She was still a teenager. She was um, basically a sophomore at Smith College. And she had just, she'd had a rotten summer. And basically the rotten summer is the, the summer that she writes about in the bell jar. Um, she winds up being hospitalized for trying to uh, die by suicide. Um, and she's brought in. And when she's there, she can't read. She can't write anymore. She is just completely just basically a, 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 an empty soul 
right, of a person, um, and uh, or a, a person lacking soul, really. She was empty. And she winds up meeting uh, her psychiatrist, a woman named Dr. Ruth Barnhouse, who is a, a real person, was a real person. We don't know a lot about her. Um, she was, though, the first female psychiatrist in New England, possibly the first female psychiatrist in the country. And, um, you know, she we follow her story as she sort of meets this patient in room 19, who happens to be Sylvia Plath. And she starts to teach her how to read and to write and how to live and to find herself again. And that's the spark. That's the start of, of the Sylvia Plath that we all know today. Well, I don't want to give away too much because I think one of the, uh, the joys of this book is that moment where she does learn to communicate again and how she does it is a great uh, uh, part of the book. We're not going to ruin that by giving away. So I really encourage people to, to read it. Uh, but let's talk about uh, uh, Dr. Ruth. Um, yes, exactly. Basically, you know, it was not easy to be uh, the first woman blank anything back in 1950s, 50s or 60s uh, in the United States. And that is part of this story. Yeah, she, um, you know, she comes up against, you know, an all male, uh, you know, uh, staff at McLean Hospital. Uh, it was early 1950s. She, you know, at the time, and I don't really go into this so much in the book, but I show it a little, there was a major split in how we practice psychiatry. Um, the, the old guard was all Freudian. It was all analysis. It was all, you know, let's talk about, you know, the, the roots of your problems. And if that didn't work, you had, you know, electroconvulsive shock therapy and you right. had, you know, right. so it's like a torture but, chamber almost. Some of the it's things. exactly it. Yeah. And it worked, but it was awful. Then you have somebody like Dr. Ruth Barnhouse who comes in and she, she's sort of the, the new guard. She's looking at, uh, you know, patients, she sees the patients outside of their illness and she sees the humanity in them and she tries to work with who they are. And she walks alongside the patient as opposed to sort of the one up, one down sort of relationship that the Freudian psychiatrists have. Um, and there was major pushback. And in reality, there was a huge divide that still exists in some way today. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that in reality and in the novel, she faces a, a tremendous battle against the, the forces that be, which really also sort of mirrors Sylvia's journey as well. So look, in this book, we get three distinct views of Sylvia Plath, but not from her. This is not a imagined in her head first person book. This is three characters looking at Sylvia Plath and, and, and we see them through their lens. Now we talked at the beginning about the curator who's handed this unbelievable uh, lockbox and manuscript and you know there's intrigue right away. It's like, is this really the handwritten first draft of the bell jar? So we, we follow that. The second we talked about uh, the psychiatrist, who is the third uh, storyteller in this novel and right. what's that context? So, Okay, so we've got the modern storyline. We've got, you know, the modern where she finds this. We have the early, early storyline. And then you have the uh, sort of the middle storyline, which is basically, it takes place in the late 50s, goes all the way through the early 60s. And we follow a woman named uh, Boston Rhodes. And Boston Rhodes is sort of Sylvia Plath's, she's her contemporary. Um, she, uh, you know, Boston is this, is this character who, she's a housewife. She's, she's a mother and she wants to be that sort of stereotypical 1950s, early 60s sort of good wife, you know, that she reads about in the magazines. And she finds herself failing in every way until she discovers poetry. And wow, she is like a natural at, at being a poet. And she, it just discovers her voice and boy, she does it fast. Robert Lowell, who's the famous, you know, uh, poet and instructor, uh, basically curates her, brings her into his famous workshop, and she becomes like the, she's going to be the lead when it comes to this confessional poetry movement. She's that good. And she's going to remain. Except for one, except for one other person, right? There's a right. And, uh, right. Exactly. The rival Sylvia is. Plath. Sylvia Plath comes in. And so Sylvia comes in, and all of a sudden we've got this giant rival 
um, who uh, is better than Boston Rhodes in almost every single way. It's like that character in the uh, in the movie Amadeus, right? Uh, going up against uh, Mozart. That's exactly um, right. Yeah. So, so the, now it's just to be clear, uh, the character of Boston Rhodes, great name, uh, is is not a real person, but based on a real person or real people, a composite of people from that time. Explain that. Yeah. So there are a couple of people that she represents. Um, uh, the biggest one though is Anne Sexton. Uh, Anne Sexton's DNA is absolutely in Boston Rhodes. Um, Sylvia Plath and, Bo and, and Anne Sexton were, like I said, contemporary, uh, just like Boston Rhodes, they were contemporaries. Um, they're in Robert Lowell's class, uh, his workshop together. Um, and you can see that they love each other in, in, in real life. You, they actually talk to each other through their poetry. Um, Sylvia would write a, a, a bunch of poems about bees and then Anne Sexton, would write a bunch of poems about bees. Uh, Sylvia would write about her father. Anne Sexton would write about her father. So they were sort of talking to each other, but also competing against each other. And every time they were, you know, they'd compete against each other, it made their work rise to a better, you know, to a higher level. They were both very, very, very good. And they loved each other. And when, when Sylvia died, Anne Sexton wrote a number of poems specifically uh, to Sylvia. Um, they wrote letters to one another. You can read Anne Sexton's journals where she talks about Sylvia showing up to class for the first time. Um, they used to go to the Ritz in the in the basement of the Ritz. There's a bar and they would drink together with uh, a number of other poets, uh, Maxine Kuhn, George Starbuck, even Robert Lowell. And they would sit around and they would read poems to each other and drink to each other. And they would get drunk together and have a great time. That was who they were. Um, and so I knew that Anne Sexton in some way needed to be part of the story. The problem was early on, I knew that I couldn't make Anne Sexton do what I needed her to do in this story. And all of a sudden I realized, well, Anne can't be in, this, in the novel anymore. It has to be somebody else. So there, there comes the, you know, the inspiration for Boston Roads. And Boston goes much, much further than Anne Sexton ever could. Um, as a result, uh, I, I think that was the moment I actually stopped becoming a nonfiction writer. That was the moment I became a novelist where I realized I could let go of, of the guardrails, right? The, the things that were sort of keeping me in place. And I could sort of find the essence of, of these characters. Um, and Boston Rose was, I think, the the moment I realized I had a novel is when I, I discovered. Well, Boston, Boston Rose is more of a villain uh, than Anne Sexton was in real life. Oh, without uh, that. And she does some things that are, are despicable. And, and frankly, in my mind, that's why she is the most intriguing character in the book, uh, because she's, uh, she's not so... Um, forthright in, in her actions. Uh, but also, I, I will say this as a writer, by writing a book about incredibly great writers, you set yourself up for quite a challenge because I think the bar is set very high. If you're going to be uh, channeling a great writer as a writer, you're gonna be writing something in that person's point of view. And I, as you know, I feel that you really nailed it. And I would say that especially uh -huh. in the chapters having to do with Boston Rhodes, I mean, some of the writing is just exquisite, quotable. I, I, you know, I told you I was jealous. I'm like, <laughs> Why didn't I write that sentence? I wish I had written that sentence. But really, yeah. you set yourself up for an incredible challenge by basically saying, "I'm going to channel, uh, you know, the, one of the greatest, some of the greatest writers of the 20th uh, century." Uh, so, congratulations on that. I think you did a, a terrific job. I, it was, it was, it was hard. I think like there, were, there were multiple moments where I think if I had stopped and said to myself you know, Lee, whoa, you are get, you're walking into a major, major trap here. This is, this is problematic. I think I would never have written the book. Well, you um, said that you thought this was a very daunting project, but it sounded like you didn't understand that until you were most of the way through it. It, it was, I was thinking I was in draft seven before I realized, <laughs> oh God, what have I done? I mean, you, right. You don't write about Sylvia Plath lightly. I mean, Sylvia Plath is like the golden goose, right? You don't, you know, you've, you're, you're taking like, an, an icon for a reason, right? You have this icon who is deeply flawed, as wonderful as she really is, deeply, deeply flawed. So you've got to approach the subject 
with honesty, but you know, with delicate, you know, with delicate hands. And so, you know, I, I I worked, you know, really hard to capture her voice to make sure that what she said was honest, even though it wasn't true, it was honest. And um, I, I had to do it in multiple eras for her. And so that was like the, the biggest challenge. I had to actually capture her voice when she was 19 years old. And then I had to capture her voice again when she was 30 years old. And I had to capture her voice as a, you know, within the novel itself that she wrote in her poetry. Um, and then I had to capture her perspective and perceptions of her uh, through, for, through real people. Um, I think any one of those, if I had really stopped to think about it, I would have been like, wow, this is insane. Um, and I would be, I would have been terrified to move forward. Um, luckily, writing through COVID makes everybody slightly insane. So I was able to sort of bypass my, my normal conscience, you know. Well, you started this to be well before uh, COVID. I did. People need, people need to know, any aspiring writers out there, it takes time to write a book. What would you estimate? I think you were about three years to put this. Uh, to um, yeah, I started writing it in earnest. I remember in November of 2017, I was at, at the Texas Book Festival and uh, I sat down, I had some time and I actually put words to paper for the first time. Um, and uh, I knew from the beginning that it was gonna have three perspectives, that it was gonna spiral through time. And I also knew structurally um, that it was gonna be sort of prismatic that we don't see the three stories, you know, chronologically, but that we actually see them sort of broken up and each scene would be sort of mashed together, almost like clockwork. Um, but as you're reading it, I knew that I wanted to read almost like three separate novels that in the third act sort of click together and we realize, oh my God, they all connect to, you know, it's one giant narrative. Um, it, and uh, so it took about, yes, uh, four, four some odd years. Well, look, the, the, uh, the book really uh, pays off uh, uh, as, a, as just as a, a book, and as, a, as an entertainment. But look, part of the reason that Sylvia Plath is such a beloved uh, literary figure and memorable in many people's mind is, is how uh, her ending her ending, not the ending yeah. of the book, but her personal ending, which was very tough. I mean, there's a lot of uh, examples in this time that you explore where people are engaged in self-harm of, of one way or another. Yeah. And uh, so that was, that also, I think they made this a particularly daunting project to, to go yeah. after. It's interesting, I, early on, when people think about Sylvia Plath, they do inherently think about her ending. Um, and I think that that's flawed. I really do. We all die which is a fact of life. And um, we all have endings. And Sylvia's ended very, very young and very tragically. She was 30 years old. She was um, in, a, in a depressive spiral. Her she book was, had I, just come out. She had not had any of her, her potential all happened after, after her death. That's after. the, tell people that about that. I mean, her book came yeah. out and then, and, and it wasn't even, the first draft wasn't even in her name. It's exactly right. She wrote it in six months. She did one edit and she published it under the name Victoria Lucas. And it wasn't even published in the United States. It was published in, in the UK. There were a thousand copies. Um, it was not considered a success at all. At, before that, she had had one collection of poetry that had come out. And, and she was well known as a poet, but she wasn't as well known as she is today. Um, and six months after the book comes out, she dies by suicide. And it's not till many years later, actually, that the bell jars, actually the, the, the real chronological order of this is, it's not until the, the early 70s that the bell jar comes overseas, is published under her real name and becomes this massive, massive touchstone. Um, and, do we and, know why it became a massive touchstone in the yeah, 70s? It, we do. Um, part of it had to do with uh, Ted Hughes. Ted Hughes, her husband, her, husband um, her actually at that point it was her ex-husband um, or soon to be ex-husband, um, had po uh, posthumously published a lot of her work and all of her collections. So she had become very, very big by the early 70s. Um, when the novel came out, it was published under her name. People already knew her name. And by that point, it was just uh, sort of like this 
you know, this massive effect, right? Like that, that basically here's this huge body of work and now here's this novel. Um, and it just caught on. And it also just sort of, I think, channeled, I mean, if you read it, it really, uh, she was ahead of her time when it comes to, um, you know, women's rights, uh, you know, the, the, the whole, you know, the women's rights movement. When she wrote The Bell Jar, it was just at the beginning of this movement. Uh, confessional poetry was a huge part of that. But by the early 70s, it had really caught on. And if you start to read, if you read The Bell Jar, you know, not for the poetry and not for the poet, but for the subject matter, it was sort of a touchstone. It, it, it was, a, a, it, it really touched on something that by the early 70s had really caught on. Um, and so, and, and, and frankly, it was just a, an absolutely stunning novel. The, the language in it, it's incredible. If you look at the, the technique that Sylvia did, I'm going to geek out a little bit here, but this is why I love the bell jar. That's so why I'm much. joining so I can geek out with you, Lee. Let's this, this, this geek <laughs> out. So here's this book. She writes this book. She's 30 years old. As she's writing this book, she's actually in a downward spiral. Okay. She is in a, in a depressive spiral. So you got manic depression, mania, depression. She is at the depression side of this thing. And she is suffering. And uh, she is writing this book almost at the behest of her, her psychiatrist. Right. She's writing this alone. Her husband's left her um, or she's left her husband. There's a, it's a, it's, there's a whole complication there. She's living on her own. She's writing this book. But you read this book from page one. She's having she's uh, her character is having she's in the mania stage. So this whole book is written from the point of view of someone who's uh, go, uh, going through mania, which is incredible because she's writing in a depressive state but writing uh, from the perspective of somebody who's in a manic state and she does it seamlessly. It is flawless. So good that you don't even realize that she's manic until the, you know, the midpoint of the novel. But the truth is from page one, she's manic. That's incredible. From a craft point of view, a perspective, it's in, it, it is a masterclass in how to, how to tell the story. Well, I have a theory of why it, it, it took till the seventies to, to really like, get its life in america yeah tell us if you look at a lot of the books that the young women were reading at that time they were reading i never promised you a rose garden they were yeah. reading like all these really horrible tortured uh books like mr and mrs bojo jones about teenage pregnancy we had a, a long co conversation about that last night um but i mean i think it was the time the timing for this book in america when it finally came out and when it came out under her name, it was the right time. I think you're absolutely right. And I think it was, it's it, the reason why it's still re relevant today is it's timeless. You know, that whole, you know, losing your mind is just, you watch this character steadily. You don't know what's happening at first, but then as you get into it, she's steadily losing her mind. It is. It's exactly right. You know, what's, I think you're absolutely right that it, it hit at the right time. Like she was ahead of her time when she wrote the book. Yeah, it wouldn't have made it in the 60s. Here. It wouldn't have. And it took that long to really catch. And the fact that she, Sylvia was so good. She could be so detailed. Um, her voice was so precise. And if you read her poetry, it's very different than the stuff that shows up in the novel. The novel is very sort of, plain language there's some beautiful lines in it it's a beautifully written book but it's not poetry so it's almost you know it's i don't necessarily know if you were reading the bell jar under victoria lucas's name you would know would, that it was you would have no her. idea that that was sylvia plath at all you know the other thing is like if you read the bell jar um you and you read her poetry though you can actually it's again it's a coded thing but you can sort of see where they intersect there's characters in her poetry that wind up in the bell jar under different names, which I think is just right, wonderful. Right. Well, I mean, one thing that people don't realize is that whole McLean Mental Institution, some really amazing people came out of it. Oh, I know. I mean, well, when you look at the, the James Taylor and his brothers and uh, the Sedgwicks, Edie Sedgwick and Monty Sedgwick, mm -hmm. you know, that whole kind of 60s kind of, you know, avant-garde kind of cool crowd they were all in McLean that was they were the good. next generation after Sylvia Plath but they were still all there trying to figure out who they were and and I mean that's what I loved when when I found out she was a McLean too because I mean I was already 
my parents should have been very worried. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> but I t- the I stuff I was right. into at that age. I, I, I love it. You know, what, what she did and what McLean did and what this book did was it made mental mental health, um, so it put it in the spotlight where it wasn't such a scary thing. It was actually somewhat trendy, if you think about it, you know, to just check yourself in for a month at McLean Hospital. Um, James Taylor did it multiple times, um, you know, um, you know, Ann Sexton, she didn't go to McLean, but she, she went to, to, to regional sort of hospitals as well. And she was there multiple times. Um, and her psychiatrist was actually somebody who also sort of helped her become the poet that she became. Um, it is absolutely fascinating. Um, well, when you look at that whole group of women poets that came up during that time, you know, like Maxine Kuhlman and all those, yeah. um, the level of their talent, it, it made way for, you know, people like, Sharon Olds and and you know they could they could write the poetry that that I'm not the funny thing is I always say I don't like poetry but I've always been a big Ann Sexton fan a Sylvia Me Plath too. fan I'm a Maxine Kuhlman fan a lot of people don't even know who Maxine Kuhlman is anymore I know it's but all these people won like Pulitzers it's it's incredible I mean Ann Sexton wound up winning a Pulitzer several years after just starting to write poetry mm-hmm. um and I, I don't consider myself a poet either or, or, or somebody who, who, who appreciates poetry. When I started writing the novel, I actually, I contacted uh, Matthew Zapruder. Do you guys know Matthew Zapruder? Um, Matthew Zapruder, he was the, public, uh, the poetry editor of the New York Times. He's a Berkeley guy. He teaches poetry. He's amazing. He wrote a book called Why Poetry. Um, I ran oh, into- I remember that book. Yeah, he's, he's, he's wonderful. And actually- Oddly enough, I ran into, remember I told you I started writing this at the Texas Book Festival in 2017? I ran into him. I just made that connection at the Texas Book Festival at a party. Um, he's incredible. And I called him early on to say, listen, I'm writing a book about poetry. I don't know anything about poetry. I don't want to fall flat on my face. What can you tell me? He taught me how to, he taught me the ins and outs of poetry. He, he explained to me why poetry, how it works. Um, you know, and, and once, you know, once I sort of got into that, I sort of, to, you know, started rereading Sylvia Plath's work and Sexton's work, and it's, it comes alive in a way that is remarkable. I couldn't wait to dive into that stuff. Well, it's interesting yeah. is that you have the poetry of Boston Rhodes in your book, and that's yeah. a fictional character. So that's you, Lee. You are a poet now, a published poet. I know, apparently. No, we, asked won't, me- we won't tell anyone, Lee. <laughs> yeah, thank you. No, I wanted to, somebody asked me. We'll give if I, Boston you know, all the credit. I, I, I do. I give her complete credit. Um, my process for coming up with these characters and their voices was very sort of meta, uh, or maybe not meta. What's the word? A method. It's very method. Um, I would I I would actually take my phone and for for about ten months walk around and dictate into my phone through Boston's point of view about everything about the world around her, even, um, and certainly plot points within the novel. But if you listen to my, my kids would sometimes hear the, the recordings. I would, I would talk with, um, I almost gave her a British accent at one point, just to sort of get <laughs> into her skin. And I, you know, I sounded like I was crazy, but what it did was it let me sort of appreciate who she was and how she saw the world um, with, in, in my mind, unconditional positive regard, because she's an awful human being but I loved her dearly. And I knew that I needed to actually, if she was going to be writing poetry, I needed to show what she was writing. And in order to do that, I had to sort of get into her mindset. And I, you know, I talk about the death of certain people and her, you know, rivalry and her thoughts on, on certain, certain uh, moments in her life. And that's where her poetry came from. So it very, very much was Boston Rhodes writing these 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 snippets of poems that actually appear multiple places throughout the novel. Well, you know, another thing that, that I have to say that your book really reminded me of was uh, Michael Cunningham's book, The Hours. Yeah. Um, which is one of my favorite books of all time. Um, Mine too. Mine too. Yeah, but it, just the way it was structured, you know, because you you get to know each character, and as you know, each character at the end of their kind of the end of their story. You know, Michael Cunningham's book, I, you know, I think there was, you know, certainly there's some DNA of that in, in this book. Um, what I loved about what he did was that he took the, you know, he took Mrs. Dalloway and then he sort of 
inverted it and and there were characters so it was almost like you were reading that story in modern times but also the manuscript it was sort of inside and out it was very talk about meta it was just all it was wonderful and poetic and absolutely beautiful um you know i think that what he did was something incredibly special um and so and certainly the prismatic approach that i took was there you know i actually the, the book that really influenced me the most when i was writing this was david mitchell's um cloud atlas wow I think that's one of Mike's favorite books. Really? Oh my! I, I, I mean, it's 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 an incredible book, and you start to you see um, David Mitchell's influence more and more and more in, in books. There is a you know he does this sort of uh, you know he takes multiple stories and breaks them in half and then connects them in really interesting ways. Um, how can I have the uh, the over story? by Richard Powers is another one where, where people are starting to take the, do this wonderful technique where they take multiple stories that seem totally disconnected and then they draw them together into a solid cohesive narrative. Um, the, uh, what was it, Cloud Cuckoo Land, I'm just looking at my list over here. Cloud Cuckoo Land was another one that was just like that. Um, Appleseed uh, was another one where you basically have these, these stories that are wildly different from one another with similar similar sort of themes throughout. I love those stories and I couldn't wait to try my hand at it. Um, little did I know that it was going to kick my butt. <laughs> Literally, I think I did 11 drafts of this novel and each one was slightly different and it was so hard to do. Um, and I, you know, so I didn't know if it was gonna, gonna work or not. So we, um, uh, Kathleen, are we gonna be able to uh, possibly take some questions? Yeah, I was gonna say, we have, we have people who are, I've been, if you've noticed, I've been looking down a little bit. We do have people um, watching on Facebook Live so they can uh, submit a question through chat or how does it work? Um, through They can do it through the message on, on Facebook Live, but on this one, you can do it through the Q&A on, on, on the... Um... Okay, sure, sure. Let's see what we got. Does anybody have any questions? Look, I, I'm, I'm gonna ask a question while we while people uh, get their thoughts down. Look, if, you know, the, the, um, this re-exploration of Sylvia Plath, which you do in such a clever, and again, I want to keep saying this, an entertaining and engaging and intriguing way. I don't want people to think this is some sort of uh, uh, academic exercise this book because it's not. It's a novel and yeah. it's uh, really engaging. Um, but you know what? We, but we have, uh, we, there are some serious issues at the core of this. Um, and we live in a time, it's interesting that this book comes out now, and of course you didn't plan it this way, but we are in a time of a kind of a mental health crisis in this country. Your book has landed at the exact moment when people are really concerned about some of the central themes that you get into. I mean, how do you, what do you think you're saying and how does it relate to what yeah. people are going through today? Well, one of the, the, it's a wonderful point, Scott. I mean, look, one of the things that that's happened because of COVID in the two years that we've been isolated from one another and the fear that we all sort of have experienced um, it's sort of, I think it's normalized mental health issues. Um, there it's, you know, I have friends of mine who are, who are psychologists and therapists, their practices are so full right now. Hmm. Um, I mean, just, I mean, they, they, they're turning people away and that is like legitimately what's happening because people are, are suddenly deeply, deeply concerned about how they're thinking and how they're reentering the world and how they're dealing with the trauma. Um, I think that Sylvia Plath and what she did with her work, not just with the bell jar, because the bell jar doesn't end with suicide. It, there's suicidal elements in it, but it doesn't end with suicide. Um, but she talks about the experience of being mentally ill and going through that process. Um, and it, it sort of normalizes it in a way. Um, that's something that I really wanted to explore in my novel. I wanted to sort of show that you know, the, the point of, of getting treatment for mental illness or any sort of trauma isn't necessarily to quote unquote cure what we're going through. It's to learn how to hold it and to live with it because these experiences don't leave us. Um, and so, you know, I think the last confessions of Sylvia P, we see a series of, you know, multiple characters who are deeply flawed in some way, shape or form. And they learn to live with their flaws and grow with their flaws. Um, I, I think that there's something really important in that message. I think you write very eloquently about that. And I do wonder, 
Do you think you could have written this book if you weren't a therapist yourself? I don't think so. I don't. I think, um, at least from my perspective, I don't think so. I, I got into these characters because I wanted to know what made them, you know, how they thought and felt, what made them behave the way that they did. And so it's no coincidence that my first character is a psychiatrist. Um, it's no, no coincidence that my second character is somebody who's, uh, you know, uh, bipolar and we get into her head completely and we follow her mania from page one. Um, and it's no coincidence that the, you know, the, uh, the modern day curator is going through her own sort of life of, 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 of trials and, and trauma that she's trying to reconcile as well. And I tried very, very hard to sort of really capture the realities of what that's about without glorifying it. Um, you know, I think that that's sort of the, the theme in all my books really is to sort of humanize the, you know, the, you know, the, the moments where we're suffering the most. Hmm. Well, one of the things that, that my question is, you would, you do have a pretty successful career as a nonfiction writer. Mm -hmm. And then to yeah. flip it and all of a sudden move into fiction, which I think you did really well, obviously. Yeah. Um, how, how was that transition for you in the writing crisis? How did that? Yeah, you know, I actually, I, I'd always wanted to be a novelist. It was, it was honestly, it was from the start, that's where I wanted to be. Um, but I also sort of knew, that I couldn't figure out what to write, truly. Um, I knew what I wanted, to, I know I knew how to write, but I didn't know what to write. And so I wound up going back to grad school to become a therapist. And then my, my, my graduate thesis became my first book, which was Super Survivors. It just got picked up by HarperCollins. And so I started writing nonfiction and made a lot of sense to me. It was narrative based. It was all narrative driven with some facts thrown in. And reality is very fat, you know, it's, a, it's, it's sometimes more fascinating than fiction. Um, but once I started writing fiction and I could let sort of the, 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 the guardrails go, I could sort of invent my own sort of world and sort of distill the essence of the people that I wanted to write about versus follow the facts. It freed me up so much that I realized, wow, I, one, it's a completely different way to, to, to approach material. And two, I love it. I absolutely, I love it more than I can explain. I, it's something I wake up for every day. Um, I, I can't wait to dive in uh, and do it again and again and again. My agent, on the other hand, told me, Lee, you can't write fiction. You have to stick with nonfiction because fiction is very hard to sell. And every nonfiction writer wants to be a, a novelist. And I was like, yeah, 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 I know, but I really want to do this. Um, and then he was like, fine, fine, fine. Let me see what you got. And I sent it into him, my first draft. And he was like, okay, Lee, this is going to be your first novel. Let's do mm. this. And he told me, he was like, I, I don't think you necessarily need to go back to nonfiction. This is, this is clearly where you want to be. Um, so well, I, mean, I, I think yeah. that, that for those of you who haven't read the book yet, and I know we've got quite a few people watching on Facebook Live, and we've got people watching on Zoom. Um, the book feels so human. You know what I mean? It feels like these are, you know, even though you don't necessarily like all these characters, you know them. They're so well defined that you know who they are from the minute they appear on the page, and you watch them evolve. and And I mean, that's what I like. I'm I'm very character driven in my, I, I like usually pretty silly books. You know, I like books <laughs> that make me laugh. That, but they have to be smart. Um, but I mean, that's what I liked about the book because I liked the fact that I felt like I knew these people. By the time I, I read that last page, I knew every single one of these characters and I understood where they were coming from. Thank you. That that means that means so much. I felt I felt like I knew them too. And it took me, you know, it took me to to really interesting places because I I always wanted to I I wanted to know Sylvia Plath. I, I yeah, think I that was did too. <laughs> I really, really did. And one of the things you learn when you're reading and learning about Sylvia Plath is that every person who knew her, knew her differently. Mm. There wasn't a single person who could come up to another person and say, hey, is Sylvia the same version that you see that I see? Like it, everybody saw what they wanted to see in Sylvia. And that was one of the things that made her so interesting was that she was an enigma, that, that 
some people saw her as passionate. Some people saw her as flighty. Some people saw her as naive. Some people saw her as sophisticated. Some people see her as tragic. And that actually brings us back to what it, sort of what you were saying, Scott, about how people remember how she died. I didn't really want this novel to be about her death. I wanted it to be about her legacy. And the, you know, that spark that, that started in such a dark place and then has wound up, you know, giving hope to millions and millions of readers uh, well past her death. Yeah, that's what I, I felt that way. And I wanted to say Mike did pipe in and you wanted to know if you guys had read Candyland yet by Jeff Jennifer Egan. It's on my list. And he list. said that if you like the multiple storylines, that you will love that book. He's been, he's been getting me to try to get me to read it. So, you know, she, Jennifer Egan is great. You know, I just reread one of her novels that was, um, did you ever read The Keep? I did. And I love, have you read The Invisible Circus? That was I one did. of my favorites. That was one of my favorites too. I yes. mean, she, she can capture tone and dread so well. I just, I, I think she's, she's incredible. Just incredible. Well, why don't we do one more? Does anybody, Scott, do you have a question for Lee or... Uh, no, I mean, if anyone from the uh, our audience, I can't I can't see them from my uh, my little library. So yeah, I'm looking I'm looking here and I'm not seeing any questions coming in. But um, gosh, you guys, this was so much fun. Thank you for having me, and 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 thank you for supporting the novel. Um, it's been a it's been a real pleasure. I think uh, one of the great things about doing the, these sort of events around the country the, over the last couple of weeks, I, I've actually I, I run into people who knew Sylvia who went wow. to school with her. Um, who, well, give us an example. That's, I can't let that go. Give us a, an anecdote. Um, well, you know, somebody really said to me that they, they, uh, they went to Smith College uh, with her. They were two years older than her. Wow. Um, and um, I, I, there was somebody who I met who was on the internship. So Sylvia was, uh, you know, famously got an internship her sophomore, uh, the year before her junior year of college at Mademoiselle Magazine. Um, and I met a woman who, a young girl at the time, who was uh, on that internship with her. And she remembers Sylvia. And she told me she can't, she can't tell if her memory of Sylvia is accurate anymore because she's read The Bell Jar. And The Bell Jar is, is a characterization of that time with her. But she remembers Sylvia being there and what she dressed and what she looked like and how, just how fun and effervescent she was. Um, and so that, that was fascinating. They were staying, they were living in, a, in an all girls hotel at the time, um, which is no longer around, but she talked, talked to me about that. And I was just, it was just such a beautiful, almost, almost a holy moment in some ways. And just to bring it back to like the story, I mean, is that the, the terrible summer that Sylvia was uh, recovering from when she has her breakdown? It was, she was there, she didn't, you know, she you didn't get the get, job of a lifetime, or as they say in the Devil Wears Prada, the job every girl wants. She gets it, but it doesn't quite work out. It doesn't. She she's um, she has a, a boss and an editor who kind of doesn't treat her very well. She gets food poisoning that summer. Um, she's uh, you know the, the girls she's with are, are are flirting with boys, and she's not quite there yet. She's not very good at it. Um, and then the worst part is she gets back home. And there's an internship at Harvard that she was supposed to get, and she didn't get it. And so that just sends her spiraling, and that is it. Yeah. She was a fascinating, I mean, definitely a fascinating creature. Oh, I thought so too. And But, you know, her writing, aside from who she was in real life, her writing is the thing that just continues to draw us back to, you know, to her. I mean... You know, we almost have to separate the author from the, the the work, which is very hard to do because her work was very, very personal. But if you read her poetry, she could write about a bedroom in a lampshade, um, the wainscoting on the on the wall um, with such detail that it, it would blow your mind. And she was doing this since the age of eight. I mean, she got her first poem published um, around that time. Uh, I, I believe it was her father died when she was eight and her first poem came out and was published in the local newspaper around that time. This is somebody who was naturally good at what she did. Um, and she just got better and better and better. And of course she did die, but it's, it's no surprise that we are now what at the, almost the 60th anniversary of the bell jar is next year. Yeah. 
if you can believe Isn't it. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, look at for those tuning in. The the book is the Last Confessions of Sylvia Pete, and is Lee Kravitz, Kravitz. Uh, his debut novel, not his debut book, but his debut novel, and uh, it's terrific. And I loved it, and I'm so glad we get to oh. have this conversation. Thank I you very much, guys. Definitely, you're going to do the plug for tomorrow night's author. Yeah, um, tomorrow so night we're enjoy, by the way. He's he. I, I read the editor. That was his, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, Stephen's a really good friend of mine. Also, um, the Gunkle is. I call it a love story between an uncle and his his niece and nephew. It's um, so for people not from the Bay Area, Gunkle means the gay uncle. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting great reviews. I've I've heard nothing but wonderful things. Oh about my it. god! It, there's parts of it that you laugh, you cry. It's my favorite kind of book. I mean, I I like a book that that takes me on the gamut of emotion, and it has to be well written. <laughs> it does. Good. I love it. I've heard nothing but great things. I think I, I did an uh, event with Christina Clancy, who uh, who uh, is a good friend of this of uh, of Stevens, and and had nothing but wonderful things to say about this book well before the book even came out. Yeah, I, I read it really. I read it in manuscript too. It's um, sure. you know, I mean, it's one of those books that I knew I was going to fall in love with it, and I started haranguing him as soon as <laughs> I knew he had a draft. So. Needless to say, Lee, if you if you have a draft of your next book, I, I would start haranguing you too. And Scott always knows I'll harangue him anytime. <laughs> give me give me three more years. I am working my <laughs> butt off on this new book right now. It is it is kicking my butt, but it, in 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 the best way possible. So, but yes, you were on you were on the list. <laughs> okay. Well, you guys, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me. Lee, thank you. Come oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Books. Oh my God! Yeah, just say when. Okay. I'll be there. Okay. Because I know you're in Oakland. I am. I, well, I, I live in I live in San Mateo, but believe it or not, um, I am now officially announcing I am actually moving to the East Bay. So oh, that's awesome. I am. So I will I will be there many, many, many times. Awesome. Well, thank you. And thank you, Mike, for, for being our, our media guru. Thanks, Mike. And thank, thank you, Scott. You. Bye, guys. Thanks, you guys. Good night, Good night. everybody. Good night. Bye, all.